All right, we are in our series called A Serious Faith, and we're exploring together this reality that our world has serious problems, and so those of us who follow Jesus need a serious faith. Now, last week, we began to talk about uh, this problem that we as followers of Jesus have, that we look around us and we see a broken world that does anything but follow the ways of Jesus. And we reminded one another last week that we really need to keep our focus not on the things happening in the world, but let's keep our focus on Jesus, who is our cornerstone, meaning our foundation. He is our capstone, meaning our treasure. And sometimes he is the stumbling stone that offends the world. And hopefully sometimes in a good way, the gospel offends us and calls us to change as well. And today is sort of a part two of that of how do we understand the world we live in so that we can appropriately respond with the good news of Jesus. So if we think about the things that have happened in our world recently, uh, we can do a little survey. February, 2022, we watched on the news as Russian forces invaded Ukraine and we saw uh, lives lost and towns exploding and blown up. Uh, more recently, on October 7th of last year, we saw Hamas invade Israel. And again, lives lost and towns and buildings blown up. And then we saw Israel retaliate and even more lives lost and buildings blown up. And, and it's hard to make sense of that, of, of you know, what's going on. Or even more recently than that, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, we saw a, a presidential candidate at a rally almost assassinated millimeters from being assassinated. And we wonder, like, how do we make sense of that? Or just a few weeks ago, as many of us were watching the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, we saw uh, this mockery. Uh, uh, maybe it was uh, making fun of the Lord's Supper. I would argue it was a representation of a Bakken feast, which if you look that up, it's even worse. And then a few days ago, we see uh, the closing ceremonies. And, and if you look into that, it wasn't any better. And we're looking around and we say, how do we respond to this? How do we make sense of this? Or we could get close to home. And, and there's been a number of things that have happened in our community and in many of your lives that just point us to the brokenness and the hurt and the pain of this world that we live in. And we just wonder how in the world are we going to make sense of this? Because many of us, we come away and we're unsettled, we're discouraged, we're disturbed, we're disheartened. And we just kind of want to shrink in our hole and hide away. Or we want to shake our fist and rage at the world. And I would argue that neither of those is a biblical response. That we need to be engaged in the world, but not with anger and frustration, but with hope and good news. And so we need a biblical framework for how to respond. Because as we look throughout history, what we see and what we discover is that there's nothing new. I mean, we often, because of what we're going through in the moment, we have this recency bias. We think like the whole world is falling apart and it's no hope and we're all, you know, what are we going to do? And what we look in history and we look in scripture as we realize that this has been a part of our world from the beginning. And we were actually warned of this. And there's some things that Jesus taught and the apostles taught us to prepare us for these kind of things. I mean, specifically, there are four things that we're taught from a biblical framework that we can need to understand because sometimes you can get on TikTok or you can get on YouTube and you can get on Instagram and we get two different versions of the gospel. And neither one of them are biblical or accurate. On, on one sense, we'll get somebody up there and they'll say, well, like, well, it's this prosperity gospel. And if you follow Jesus and you'll have no problems anymore and, and you'll get all this wealth and all this happiness and everything will go well for you. But then we look at the call of Jesus and he says, if you want to follow me, you got to take up your cross and die to self. That uh, doesn't seem to line up. But then we'll get on the other extreme and, and I call these people that stoke fear. And, and they just spend, send out these messages or these prophecies that, that say, you know, all these scary things are going to happen and you need to be afraid. You look at Deuteronomy 18 and it tells us how do you measure the, the, uh, the message of a prophet? Well, everything a prophet says must come true or it's not a prophet. And so we got to watch out for these extremes of this prosperity gospel or stoking fear, because really what they're looking for is they just want more views and they want more power and they want more influence. We need a biblical framework for how to respond to this. So there's four things that we're taught. The first is that conflict is going to increase. 
Go this week and and read Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is giving one of his last teachings. And right there at the beginning of that chapter, he says, listen, in the last days or the last age, and that can be an indeterminate number of years, in this last age, kingdom will fight against kingdom and nation against nation. And it's going to increase in intensity. It's going to increase in scope. And it's going to increase in frequency. Conflict is going to increase. Later in that chapter, starting in verse 9, Jesus tells us that not only will conflict rise, but holiness will decrease. And people are going to be more and more ungodly. Paul talked about this as he writes a letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says this, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days or the last age. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, We can see more and more of that in our world, but this was written 2,000 years ago. Uh, This is what we should watch out for. So conflict will increase, godliness will decrease. The third thing that we're taught from a biblical framework is that people will listen less and less to truth. And truth will become more and more offensive to other people. In that same letter, Paul writes this to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 3. He says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. The two tragedies of that statement, number one, is that people will stop listening to truth. And number two is that there'll be a whole line of people ready to teach them deception. That's the world that we live in. It's the world that we have to watch out for. And then the fourth thing that we're taught from a biblical perspective is that there is a spiritual enemy called Satan who has at least some authority and rule in this world. There's three places in scripture I want you to look this week in, in addition to Matthew 24. Uh, one is Mark, I mean, Matthew 4 or Luke 4. Jesus has an encounter with Satan. We call it the temptation of Jesus. In between his baptism and beginning his ministry, he's 40 days in the wilderness and he has this showdown with Satan and he gives him three temptations. And the second temptation of Satan is that if Jesus will bow down to him, then he will give him kingdoms and authority that's been given to him. And what I want you to notice about that encounter is that Jesus does not say to, Jesus, uh, to Satan, you don't have power and authority. Instead, Jesus assumes that what Satan is saying is correct, and he just responds, no, the scripture says that we will bow down to no one but the Lord. Why? Because Jesus knows that for a time, Satan does have power and rule and authority in this world. A second place is in John uh, chapter 12, verse 31, and Jesus makes this statement that the prince of this world will soon be thrown out. Now, who's he talking about? Satan, who is the prince of this world, meaning he has some power. He has some authority that's been granted to him for a time in this world. Or one more place. In John chapter 18, Jesus has a conversation with Pilate. Jesus has been arrested. He's been beaten. Now he's on trial. And he's standing before Pilate. And Pilate says to him, listen, I have the power and authority to to set you free. Just tell me, are you a king? And this is Jesus' response in verses 36 through 38. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my followers would come and save me. But what Jesus is saying is, I have a kingdom. It's coming. It's just not here in this world that you live in. And so we've got these four biblical frameworks to think about that that the world is going to increase in conflict. It's going to increase in deception and ungodliness. And it's going to uh, increase in this, this tension that we see because there's a ruler of this world who is an enemy of our soul, an enemy of, of God's kingdom. And so theologians often call this tension that we live in the already but the not yet. God has already brought his kingdom. Jesus has already brought victory. The Holy Spirit has already come and embodied the church and we are sent as ambassadors of this kingdom, but the complete fulfillment of it is not yet here. One day Jesus is gonna come again. The goal is not just to get to heaven, but Jesus is gonna come again and he's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth and his kingdom will be on earth. 
But right now we live in this tension. And so the question is, as people of the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of this world, how do we live in this world? And this is what Peter is talking about already 2,000 2000 years ago. He's telling the church, this is how you live in the tension. So let's take a look. We're going to look at chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to jump ahead to chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. All right, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So here's the, the first thing that I want us to recognize is that Peter says to these already in verse one, he says to you foreigners, to you exiles, to you people who do not belong in the place where you find yourself. You're living in a place where you feel isolated. You're living in a place where you feel opposition all around you. You're living in a place where you can't find a sense of belonging. I mean, let's zero in on verse 11 and look again. Dear friends, I urge you as what? As foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Who are these people that Peter is talking to? Well, let's take a look at a map. This is uh, the first century, uh, the world that Peter lived in. And in verses one and two of chapter one, he says, I'm calling out to you exiles. And then he gives some regions here. Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, Pontus, parts of Asia. And we need to remember that, that most of these people came from Israel, which is down here on the southern part of the map that we can't see. And now they're living in all these other places. Why? Well, we read through the, the book of Acts and we begin to see that persecution began to hit the church and they were in danger, quite literally in danger for their own lives and they began to scatter throughout the empire. And it's on the other side of the scattering that Peter is writing to the church and he's saying to them, I know that you are exiles. You're living in a place that's not your home. And it's a mixture of Jewish people and Gentile people who are trying to follow the faith. And they find themselves isolated, mostly in small towns scattered throughout the empire with very few Christians around them. And they have this deep, deep feeling of living as exiles in a place where they don't belong. What we need to understand for you and me is that we also are exiles, now, I know some of you here today, like you were born and raised and lived your whole life in the same place. And, and, and you know, every, you can't go a day without seeing a cousin or an uncle or, a, you know, a grandparent somewhere in town. And, and you feel like this is your home. But, but what we need to understand is that spiritually, we are foreigners and exiles living in a world where we don't belong. Now, what does this look like for us? How do we, how do we grasp this? How do we understand that we live in a world where we don't belong. Well, I want to walk us through a, a, a timeline of history where we see this pattern of how the church relates to the world over time. So if we would go all the way back to Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in, in the believers and Peter goes out and he begins to preach the gospel for the very first time, we encounter what we call a pre-Christian culture. And what I want us to notice about a pre-Christian culture is there's a wide gap between the culture of the church and the culture of the world. And there's some things that we can understand about this. First is that most people have never heard the gospel. As Peter goes out to preach the gospel that Jesus Christ was the Lord who came to earth, he took his, our sins into his body and he defeated it in sin and rose from the dead. For many people, that was the first time they heard the whole of that gospel. Our modern day version of that would be if a missionary goes into a, an unreached part of the world where people had never heard the name of Jesus before and they begin to preach the gospel. That's a pre-Christian world. And so evangelism is quite literally introducing people to Jesus through the message, the good news of the gospel. 
And the danger here is that as we do that, because we have a conflict of cultures, that people would experience persecution, attack, ostracized, isolated. And so they watch out for that danger. But over time, as the gospel begins to take root, we move from a pre-Christian culture to what we see in history as a Christian culture. And what we discover is that the culture of the church and the culture of the world now come together. And in this world, most people have heard about Jesus and many have accepted and trusted in the good news about Jesus. And even in, for those people who have never accepted Jesus, they don't surrender to him, don't trust to him, they have been impacted by the culture of the church. So as we see the cult, church begin to spread, we see the development of things that are uniquely Christian at the time, like things like the development of hospitals, the development of schools, the creation of charities, women's rights, rights for children, the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage. Those were uniquely Christian things when they came into the world. And even for those who did not receive the gospel, they began to adopt the values of the church. And so we can begin to grow comfortable in the world we live in because there's not this huge gap. Now, there's still the danger of some isolated persecution and religious conflict. As the church grows in power, there's definitely some danger of um, the corruption that power brings. But we see the influence of the church throughout the world. Many of us, if not most of us, are still under the assumption that this is the world that we live in. I want to argue to you that we don't live in this world anymore. As we look throughout history, there's one more phase that we see in this relationship between the church and the world, and it's the post-Christian culture. And now the gap of the cultures has widened again. We live in a world where most people have heard about Jesus. Guys, in DeSoto County, it is really hard to go find somebody who's never heard about Jesus. Many people have some idea, they've heard some version of it. The only problem is that they are biased about the message or they think they have a certain version of the message that's been twisted to make it more acceptable, to make it more pleasurable. And so they're not really accepting the true Jesus, they're accepting some version of Jesus or they've convinced themselves why Jesus isn't a person that they wanna receive anyway and they've already made up in their mind all the arguments that they have to refute anything you have to say. And so we're struggling of what evangelism looks like and what we discover as followers of Jesus, the calling of us in this world is to redeem the true message of the gospel, not a twisted version of the gospel that we wanna hear, not some uh, version of it that is easier to receive. And what we find is that the real temptation is not persecution. Guys, we like to think that we're persecuted. We know nothing about persecution. I mean, the first century of Christians living in that that pre-Christian culture lived under the reign of Emperor Nero. And Nero hated Christians so much that he had this habit of arresting Christians and then he would bring them into his his castle, his, his throne room or whatever, his palace, and he would cover them in wax and he would set them on fire to light his garden. That's persecution. We know nothing of that. And so the danger for us in this post-Christian culture is that we would compromise our beliefs to be better accepted in a world that once accepted us. And so we gotta be so very careful, A, to understand what is the world we live in, and B, to understand how is it that I respond? How do I understand that the world is no longer the Christian culture that I once took for granted? That there are people all around me, to my surprise, who no longer hold Christian values? who no longer hold the same beliefs. And once I realize that, and rather than getting shocked by it, I understand it, how do I respond to it? And so Peter talks to that. He says, when you live in a world as exiles, when the world around you is not accepting you, this is what you do. And this is what he says, verse 11, abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul, And live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, when you live in a world that doesn't accept Jesus, live according to the ways of Jesus. And actually by this point in the letter, just here in in 1 Peter chapter two, this is the fourth time that Peter has encouraged us to live lives of faithfulness. 
But what we see is that each of the four times, he gives us a different reason for doing so. So if we go back, right in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he tells us that faithfulness in trials proves genuine faith and points to an internal inheritance. So at this point, he says, your faithfulness and obedience to God is really about you and God. And you've got an eternal inheritance coming to you, waiting for you. And if you want to have greater certainty of God's work in you, surrender to what he's doing and live a life of obedience and faithfulness. That encourages you to understand that your faith is real. It goes on from there in the same chapter. In in verse 14, we discover that faithfulness is a response to God who saves us through the blood of Jesus. Later in that chapter, he says, listen, you've been saved, redeemed, set free, not by gold or anything else that you can find on this earth, but by the precious blood of Jesus. And because God did for you what only God could do for you, our only proper response is this life of worship where I say, Lord, whatever you want from me, the answer is yes. And I will live in obedience to you, not to earn my way into heaven, but as a response that you've already opened the way for me. And a third time in chapter two, he tells us to be faithful. And this time he says that faithfulness grows us in spiritual maturity. He says, you wanna be like children who drink pure spiritual milk and grow in your maturity in Christ. And each and every time I make a commitment to surrender to the Holy Spirit and me, and I say yes to the ways of God, I'm growing in maturity, meaning my desires are changing to look more like Jesus. My thinking is changing to look more like Jesus and my will is changing to be more like Jesus. Each and every time I surrender to him in faithful obedience. And then we get here to chapter two, this fourth time that Peter calls us to be faithful. And here we see that faithfulness points others to God and his kingdom. So let's look one more time in, in this fourth time where he tells us to be faithfully obedient. He says, abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that, all right, here's the so that, here's the why, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see who? Your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So here's the ultimate goal. Not that they see you and say how awesome you are. Like you're so, you're such a good person. Like you're so nice. You're so kind. No, that's not the point. The point is for us to point people to God. To be able to say to them, look, the reason that I live this way is because there's a God who loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to take my sin into his body and then he destroyed it in his death and he rose from the dead so that I could have the hope of eternal life and it happened in history and it's verifiable by so many different witnesses in the historical account. It's the most reasonable conclusion that this is what happened and it has changed my life and it can change your life too. That's what Peter is calling us to, that yes, we live in a world that doesn't live the way we do. But because of that, we can point them to something greater. We're not shocked when people who don't love Jesus don't act like him. We're not shocked and surprised when people who haven't received the truth don't live in truth. We're not shocked and surprised when people who live in the world are corrupted by the deception of the world. We're prepared for that. We see it coming and we respond appropriately. So what does that look like practically for you and I? Well, here in these just short two verses, verses 11 and 12, we have five really practical things that Peter calls us to do. Here's the first one. Living as kingdom people means that you look at your own heart first. Notice this. Peter has an opportunity to speak to these people who are living isolated, exiles, without a lot of Christian support around them. He's giving them the keys to how you live. Notice what he does not say. He does not tell them, please go into the town and get other people to start behaving better. He says nothing about that. What he says is, I want you to focus on what God is doing in you and live your life as a reflection of who God is. How would our lives and relationships and encounters with the world be different if rather than casting a stone at other people or rushing to judgment for other people, what if we said, Lord, would you help me understand my heart? (laughs) 
God, where am I failing to trust you? God, where am I, even with good behavior, where's my motivation not in line? Where am I being a good person because I want honor or respect or reward from others rather than focusing on an inheritance I have in you? Now, what's happening in my heart? Now, notice, Scripture does not tell us that we don't stand for truth. It does not tell us that we don't hold others accountable. It does not tell us that we can't make judgments against a broken world. It just says that we have to do it from a place built on the foundation of the grace given to us through Jesus and the truth of the gospel, not based on our own perception of righteousness. We don't get to just point fingers at other people without the gospel first wrecking our own hearts and minds. And so we look at our own heart first. You know, Jesus said it this way. Why are you focusing on the speck in your friend's eye when you've got a log in your own? It doesn't mean that we don't go to a brother and lovingly pull them back into the way. Scripture's full of those examples. It just means we look at our own heart first. But then from there, he says that we need to actively engage. Notice that he says we've got these evil fleshly desires that are doing what? Waging war against you. This, this is not some passive, cutesy little thing. Uh, we are literally living in a spiritual war every single moment of every single day. And you don't accidentally fall into the holiness and righteousness and, and lives that God is calling us to live. We have to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I choose you all over again. I, I'm trusting in you all over again today, Lord. I'm surrendering to you all over again, and I want to pursue everything you have for me. And so I'm not going to wait for, for somebody else to do it. Way too often, this is the root of a lot of our struggles. We are waiting for somebody else to live out the faithfulness that God calls us to live out. Maybe we're waiting for a church leader to do it. Maybe we're, we're waiting for our parents to do it. Maybe we're waiting for a friend to do it. Maybe we're waiting for some cultural icon to do it. Maybe we're waiting for government leaders to do it. And we just, we get so frustrated and hurt when they don't do it. And I know that because we get all worked up about it. Of why aren't they living out this? When Peter's, and, and the call on us was never for somebody else to do it, it's for us to do it. And so we've got to change our perspective. Stop expecting non-Christian people to act like Christians and say, Lord, how do I act like a person who's encountered Christ? And I'm going to be active in this and not letting somebody else take responsibility for what you've called me to do. The next thing he says is we've got to create boundaries. Create boundaries. And here the call on us is to do three things. We protect, we prevent, and we prepare. The first thing that we do is we protect our heart. Guys, we live in a world that is just full of broken, hurting people. I mean, every once in a while, we might encounter somebody who's just truly evil. But most of the time, we just live amongst people who are just really hurting. And they lash out, and they say things, and they do things, or they don't say, or they don't do. You know, and one of the things that I, I call us to as a church so often is we've got to have a thick skin and a soft heart. We've got to protect ourselves from the attacks, the manipulation, the lies, the, the lashing out that comes and not be so easily offended, but then in turn respond to people with love and compassion and kindness. And so we've got to protect our heart. Then we've got to prevent the temptations that we can before they ever come. So much of the purpose of boundaries is to protect us from danger before we ever get to the danger. And so we've got to prevent some of the temptations and, and not put ourselves in positions, which may mean not having certain relationships or not going to certain places or not watching certain things or not putting yourself in a certain position. Why would you ever want to have to make the choice to not engage? Why don't you just prevent the opportunity from ever happening? And then we've got to prepare. And what we're preparing for is the inevitable moment when we have to choose that all the prevention in the world can't prevent everything that's gonna come our way and we need a way to prepare in the moment of temptation, how do I have things in place that will lead me toward God instead of this brokenness and sin and death? And so there's some questions we can ask. Uh, one question you can ask is, well, what is the plan I can implement in the moment? When it comes, 
What are the action steps that I can take to get me to where I need to be? Another question I can ask is, who are the people who can help me when I need it? Who can I call? Who can I text? Who can I get to come help me or walk with me in that moment? And then a third question is, what are some practices that I can implement that will shape me that I'll be better equipped in the moment? Some things like worship and prayer and reading scripture and time with the Lord. Those are not things that just God is giving us brownie points. They're things that shape us so that we're prepared when the moment comes that we can choose Jesus and not the world. And so we've got to create some boundaries. But it's not just about going on the defensive. We also move forward and we want to pursue good fruit. What does Peter say? So I want you to live holy lives, good lives, pointing people to God and giving him glory. It's not just about refraining from doing evil, but it's about doing good. And I'm reminded of the, the fruit of the Spirit in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Where he says, let us be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These things that the Holy Spirit does in us. Let's pursue those things. Let's live our lives for the things of God and of heaven. Truth and purity and holiness and things that glorify God. So what if we get up in the morning and we say, Lord, what do we have for today? How can we impact people together today? The Holy Spirit in me. God, how can I be generous today? Lord, is there a way I can be forgiving today? Lord, is there a way that I can be kind or loving or loyal? Is there a way that I can lift somebody up, encourage somebody, support somebody? Is there something I can do to go out of my way to love sacrificially today so that I can point somebody to you? We pursue the good. And then all of this ultimately is done so that we can point to Jesus. Peter says that every act that we do of goodness that, that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and, and it's done for the sake of God, it's going to point people to God's glory. And here's the thing where we need to realize, not a single one of us is ever responsible for the response that we get as we point people to Jesus. Because the result will always, always, always will be for God's glory. And it's just going to be in one of two ways. Either the Holy Spirit works and they surrender to the gospel and they receive Jesus and they bring glory to God as they worship him with their lives. And we're gonna complete that in heaven one day and in the new heaven and new earth, we're gonna worship God with our lives. Or, and it's not to be harsh, but it's just reality. Because of who God is, that he's a God of glory and righteousness and justice and holiness and everything that God does is right, that at the end of it all, everybody who's rejected Jesus is also gonna bring glory to God because of his righteous judgment. And so really the response, I'm not responsible for and shouldn't lose sleep over. I'm only responsible for sharing the message of loving people, of being compassionate with people, of being kind, of speaking the name of Jesus, of sharing my story that I'm pointing to people to him. And then either way, the result will glorify God, which is my ultimate goal. To do that, guys, we've got to realize the world that we live in. It's not the Christian world that we would like it to be. You know, this is not even a recent development. I mean, this way back in the late 1600s, this whole thing began. The roots were laid with the great enlightenment as people began to question the truth of the gospel. They began to question the truth of scripture and try to manipulate it and twist it to be something that was more palatable to them. And ever since that movement, we've been moving further and further and further away from the truth. And now we find ourselves living in a post-Christian world. And if we wanna see what's coming, we just need to look to our brothers and sisters living in other parts of the West in Europe, where we have beautiful but empty cathedrals. But nevertheless, our call has not changed. Just like Peter spoke to a pre-Christian world that he says, you're living in this hostility, your goal is to look at your life and live out the gospel with what you do and what you say. The call is on, uh, on us is the same. We live out the gospel with what we say and what we do. We just understand the people that we live it with and speak it to. That they are a people who think They've come to the conclusion of the gospel. 
they think that they've come to a truth, whether it's a twisted version of who Jesus is and the life we live or a rejection of it. They think that they've come to a conclusion that the world has supported them in. And one of the things that I try to hold on to is not getting angry at people for being confused, but being angry with a world that's normalized that confusion. And so we live in this tension of truth and grace, the already and not yet, loving people and speaking truth. We've got to wake up. I want to spend less and less energy being angry, less and less energy being hurt, less and less energy being surprised, and more and more energy loving people, more and more energy speaking truth, more and more people, more and more energy inviting people to what God's doing. And so three questions I ask us. Have you surrendered to the truth of the gospel? Not a version of the gospel, not a prosperity, not a fear stoking, but a truth of the gospel that Jesus reigns, that Jesus did for us what we cannot do, that we're saved not by behavior, but by the blood of Jesus, that we have heaven waiting for those who have surrendered to him, that there's a new heaven and a new earth coming where Jesus will be Lord of all. Have we fully surrendered to that gospel? If you haven't, that's where it begins. Not a doctrine, not a church, not a program, not a Bible study, but to the person of Jesus. The second question I ask is, do we understand the calling of us to redeem the message of the true gospel? Part of our effort needs to be not fighting with people, but just focusing our energy on this is the true gospel and we need to say it, we need to live it which means that we've got to get out of our holy huddles and our Sunday school classes and our, our gatherings with people who think just like us. We've got to get to engage with people who don't think like us and speak it and live it. And then the third thing is do we speak it with love? I wanna encourage you of, of any energy you spent lost on frustration or anger or sadness or, or shock, can we commit ourselves to realize what is around us and commit to love people with the truth. And there's a simple question we can ask and I'll close with this. Are you complaining or are you contributing to the work of the gospel? No more complaining, let's contribute. So if you'll stand, I wanna pray for us because we need the Holy Spirit. This is not something we can force ourselves to do. The Holy Spirit must convict us, must teach us, must strengthen us and enable us to do this work, to live as, as people of the kingdom of God in a post-Christian world. So Holy Spirit, we invite you as we pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the good news. Thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us to take our sin into his body, to take it to the grave, to defeat it and rise from the dead. God, we thank you for the grace that has been your plan before you ever laid the foundation of the earth. Thank you that you send the Holy Spirit into every believer who surrenders by faith, that you fill us with the fruit of the Spirit, that you fill us with spiritual gifts, you fill us with unity and a calling as the body of Christ. Father, we repent of all the time we have spent pointing fingers when we should have been living the life as kingdom people. We let that go, we surrender, and we ask your forgiveness. And we pray that as we leave this place, that we'll be a people on a mission in our schools, in our work, in our neighborhoods, that you would work in and through us. And we pray that our lives would look more and more like Jesus who was always described as a person of compassion. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us as we repent of all the complaining. We want to contribute to your kingdom work. So convict us, encourage us, build us up as you need to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.